Socialism, Utopian and Scientific by Friedrich Engels Chapter 3 Historical Materialism Finally, modern industry and the opening of the world market made the struggle universal and at the same time gave it an unheard of virulence. Advantages in natural or artificial conditions of production now decide the existence or non-existence of the individual capitalists, as well as of whole industries and countries. He that falls is remorselessly cast aside, and is the Darwin Darwinian struggle of the individual for existence transferred from nature to society with intensified violence. The conditions of existence natural to the animal appear as the final term of human development. The contradiction between socialized production and capitalistic appropriation now presents itself as an antagonism between the organization of production in the individual workshop and the anarchy of production in society generally. The capitalistic mode of production may moves in these two forms of the antagonism in imminent to it from its very origin, and it is never able to get out of that vicious cycle which Fourier had already discovered. What Fourier could not, indeed, see in his time is that the circle is gradually narrowing, that the movement becomes more and more of a spiral, and must come to an end, like the movement of planets by collusion with the center. It is the compelling force of anarchy in the production of society at large that more and more completely turns the great majority of men into proletarians, and it is the masses of the proletariat again who will finally put an end to anarchy in production. It is the compelling force of anarchy in social production that turns the limitless perfectibility of machinery under modern industry into a compulsory law by which every individual industrial capitalist must perfect his machinery more and more under penalty of ruin. But the perfecting of machinery is making human labor superfluous. If the in introduction and increase of machinery means the displacement of millions of manual by a few machine workers, Improvement in machinery means the displacement of more and more of, a of the machine workers themselves. It means, in the last instance, the production of a, num of a number of available wage workers in excess of the average needs of capital, the formation of a complete industrial reserve army, as I called it in 1845 available at the times when industry is working at high pressure to be cast out upon the street when the inevitable crash comes a constant dead weight upon the limbs of the working class in its struggle for existence with capital a regulator for keeping of wages down to the low level that suits the interests of capital Thus it comes about, to quote Marx, that machinery becomes the most powerful weapon in the war of capital against the working class, that the instruments of labor constantly tear the means of subsistence out of the hands of the laborer, that the very product of the worker is turned into an instrument for his subjugation. Thus it comes about that the economizing of the instruments of labor becomes at the same time, from the outset, the most reckless waste of labor power, and robbery based upon the normal conditions which labor functions, that machinery. 
The most powerful instrument for shortening labor time becomes the most unfailing means for replacing every moment of the laborer's time and that of the family at the disposal of the capitalist, for the purpose of expanding the value of his capital. Das Kapital English Edition, page 406 Thus it comes about that the overwork of some becomes the preliminary condition for the idolis, idolisness of others. That modern industry, which hunts after new consumers over the whole world, forces the consumption of the, mar of the masses at home down to a starvation minimum, and doing thus destroys its own home market. The law that always equilibrates the relative surplus population or industrial reserve army to the extent and energy of accumulation. This law rivets the laborer to capital more firmly than the wedges of the Vulcan did Prometheus to the rock. It establishes an accumulation of misery corresponding with the accumulation of capital. Accumulation of wealth at one pole is, therefore, at the same time accumulation of misery, agony of, of toil, slavery, ignorance, brutality, mental degradation, and the opposite side. It is on the side of the class that produces its own product, product in the form of capital. Marxist cap Das Kapital, page 661. And to expect any other division of the products from the capitalist mode of production is the same time is the same as expecting the electrodes of a battery not to decompose acidulated water, not to liberate oxygen at the positive hydrogen at the negative pole, so long as they are connected with the battery. We have seen that the ever-increasing perfectibility of modern industry is, by the anarchy of social production, turned into a compulsory law that forces the individual industrial capitalist always to improve his machinery, always to increase its productive force. The bare possibility of extending the field of production is transformed Favor him into a similar, similarly compulsory law. The enormous expansive force of modern industry, compared with which that of Cassus' mere child's play, appears to us now as a necessity for expansion, for qualitative and quantitative, that laughs at all resistance. Such resistance is offered by consumption, by sales, by the markets for the products of modern industry. But a capacity for extension extensive and intensive of the markets is primarily governed by quite different laws that work much less energetically. The extension of the markets cannot keep pace with the extension of production. The collision becomes inevitable. And as this cannot produce any real solution as so long as it does not break in pieces the capitalist mode of production, the collisions become periodic. Capitalist production has begun another vicious cycle. As a matter of fact, since 1825, when the first general crisis broke out, the whole industrial and commercial world production and exchange among all civilized people and their more or less barbaric hangarons are thrown out of joint about once every ten years. Commerce is at a standstill, the markets are glutted, products accumulate as multitudinous as they are unsaleable. Hard cash disappears, credit vanishes, factories are closed. The mass of the workers are in want of the means of subsistence, because they have produced too much of the means of subsistence. Bankruptcy falls upon bankruptcy, execution upon execution. 
that stagnation lasts for years. Productive forces and products are wasted and destroyed wholesale until the accumulated mass of commodities finally filter off, more or less depreciating in value until production and exchange gradually begin to move again, little by little. The pace quickens, it becomes a trot, the industrial trot breaks into a canter, the canter in turn grows into a headlong gallop of a perfect steeplechase of industry, commercial credit, and speculation, which finally, after breakneck leaps, ends where it began. The ditch of a crisis. And so over and over again. And we have now, since the year 1825, Anno Domini, gone through this five times. And at the present moment, 1877, Anno Domini, we are going through it for the sixth time. And the character of these crises is so clearly defined that Fourier hit all of them off when he described the first crisis, Peratherique, a crisis from Prolethra. In these crises, the contradiction between socialist production and capitalist appropriation ends in a violent explosion. The circulation of commodities is, for the time being, stopped. Money, the means of circulation, becomes a hindrance to circulation. All the laws, production, and circulation of commodities are turned upside down. The economic collision has reached its apogee. apogee. The mode of production is the rebellion against the mode of exchange. The fact that a socialized organization of production within the factory has developed so far that it has become incompatible with the anarchy of production in society which exists side by side with and dominates it is brought home to the capitalists themselves by the violent concentration of capital that occurs during crises. Through the ruin of many large and a still greater number of small capitalists. The whole mechanism of the capitalist mode of production breaks down unto, under the pressure of the productive forces, its own creations. It is no longer able to turn all this mess of means of production into capital. They lie fallow, and for that very reason the Industrial Reserve Army must also lie fallow. Means of production, means of subsistence, available laborers, all the elements of production and of general wealth are present in abundance, but abundance becomes the source of distress and want, as quoted to Fourier. Because it is the very thing that prevents the transformation of the means of production and subsistence into capital. For in capitalistic society, the means of production can only function when they have undergone a preliminary transformation into capital, into the means of explaining human labor power. The necessity of this transformation of, into capital of the means of production and subsistence stands like a ghost between these and the workers. It alone prevents the coming together of the material and personal levers of production. It alone forbids the means of production to function. The workers to work and live. On the one hand, therefore, the capitalistic mode of production stands convicted of its own incapacity to further direct these productive forces. On the other, these productive forces themselves of increasing energy press forward to the removal of the existing contradiction, to the abolition of their quality as capital, to the practical rec recognition of their character as social production forces. <coughs> this rebellion of the, re of the productive forces as they grow more and more powerful against their quality as capital the stronger and stronger command that their social character shall be recognized forces the capital class itself to treat them more and more 
as social productive forces, so far as this is possible under capitalist conditions. The period of industrial high pressures with its unbounded inflation of credit, not less than the cash itself, but a collapse of great capitalist establishments tends to bring about that form of socialization of, of great masses of the means of production which we meet within the different kinds of joint stock companies. Many of these means of production and of distribution are, from the outset, so colossal that, like the railways, they exclude all other forms of capitalistic expansion. At a further stage of evolution, this form also becomes insufficient. The producers, on a larger scale, in a particular branch of an industry, in a particular country, unite in a trust, a union for the purpose of regulating production. They determine the total amount to be produced, parcel it out amongst themselves, and thus enforce the selling price fixed beforehand. But trusts of this kind, as soon as business becomes bad, are generally liable to break up, and on this very account compel a yet greater concentration of association. The whole of a particular industry is turned into one gigantic joint stock company. Internal competition gives place to the internal monopoly of this one company. This has happened in 1890 with the English Akalai production, which is now, after the fusion of 48 large works in the hands of one company, conducted it conducted under a single plan, and with a capital of six million pounds. In the trusts, freedom of competition changes into its very opposite, into monopoly. And the production Without any definite plan of capitalistic society capitulates to the production upon a definite plan of the evading socialistic society. Certainly, there is so far still to, to the benefit and advantage of the capitalists, but in this case the, the exploitation is so palpable that it must break down. No nation will put up with, a, with, the, with production conducted by trusts with so bare-faced an exploitation of the community by a small band of dividend mongers. In any case, with trusts or without the official representative of capital society, the state will ultimately have to undertake the direction of production. This necessity for conversion into state property is felt first in the great institutions for intercourse and communication, the post office, the telegraphs, the railways. If the crises demonstrate the incapacity of the bourgeoisie for managing any long, longer modern productive forces, the transformation of the great establishment establishments for production and distribution into joint stock companies, trusts, and state property show how unnecessary the bourgeoisie are for that purpose. All the social functions of the capitalist has no further social function than that of pocketing dividends, tearing off coupons, and gambling on the stock exchange where the different capitalists despoil one another of their capital. At first, the capitalistic mode of production forces out the workers. Now it forces out the capitalists and reduces them, just as it reduced the workers to the ranks of surplus population, although not immediately into those and the Industrial Reserve Army. 
but the transformation either into joint stock companies and trusts or into state ownership does not do away with the capitalistic nature of the productive forces. In the joint stock companies and trusts, this is obvious. In the modern state, again, is only the organization that bourgeois society takes on in order to support the external conditions of the capitalist mode of production against the encroachments as well as as well of the workers as of individual capitalists. The modern state, no matter what its form, is essentially a capitalist machine. The state of the capitalists, the ideal personification of the total national capital. The more it proceeds to the taking over of productive forces, the more does it actually become the national capitalist. The more citizens does it exploit, the workers remain wage workers, proletarians. The capitalist relation is not done away with, it is rather brought to a head. But brought to a head, it topples over. State ownership of the productive forces is not the solution of the conflict, but concealed within it are the technical conditions that form the element of that solution. This solution can only consist in the practical recognition of the social nature and the modern forces of production, and therefore in the harmonizing of the socialized character and the means of production. And this can all this can only come about by society openly and directly taking possession of the productive forces which have outgrown all control, except that of society as a whole. The social character of the means of production and of their products today reacts against the producers, periodically disrupts all production and exchange, acts only like a law of nature working blindly, forcibly, destructively. But with the taking over by society of the productive forces, the social character of the means of production and of the products will be utilized by the producers with a perfect understanding of its nature and instead of being a source of disturbance and period periodical collapse, will become the most powerful lever of production itself.